Hey everybody, my name is Garen and this is CitizenDiplomacy.net. I'm on a mission to talk to one person from every country in the world and today we're talking to Shahiba from Uzbekistan. Shahiba is a journalist and she reports on things that are going on in Uzbekistan and she lives in London because those things aren't always the best. And, um, you know, she needs to be where she can speak out and speak freely about uh, what's happening in her country without being silenced or punished or anything. So it's a really interesting conversation to learn about Uzbekistan, both in you know good ways and bad ways. And then just to learn from Shahiba, too, about, you know, being somebody who loves her country and is outspoken and, and working for change. So uh, I hope that you enjoy this conversation. And here's Shahiba from Uzbekistan. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Thank you for talking to me nice today. To you too. Thank you for talking today. Right. What do you want to talk about? I uh, use Uzbekistan. Uh, so, uh, I'm talking to one person from every country in the world. I just want to do something, you know, for people that uh, can't travel themselves and meet people. I really believe just in the power of, you know, being able to see somebody's face and meet them and hear their voice, where it's no longer just you know, you see on TV or read in the newspaper that these people are this way, but you actually have a personal interaction, you know. So for anybody who has never met somebody from Uzbekistan or been there, I'd just like to talk to you and ask you about your country and kind of, you know, humanize your country a little bit. Okay, let's humanize it. Yeah, let's do it. So I was reading about some of your, your work, so maybe we could just... You know, you could tell me just generally about Uzbekistan a little bit and then start telling me about your work. And I was reading about, you know, um, your work with uh, women's rights and, you know, um, ideas for the future of your country and things like that. Right. In, in general, Uzbekistan is um, a, a big country, which is the most popular, populous in Central Asia. Oh. It's, it's the most populous country in Central Asia, meaning it's got like more than 30 million people. Okay. Uh, its main feature is that A, unfortunately, it borders Afghanistan, and B, it's uh, the second only double landlocked country in the world, which we don't have access to. Season now, and neighbors don't have access to the sea either. Uh, um, uh, yeah, that's, that's the main thing. Maybe it's the main problem. So it's probably hard, uh, you know, for trade and commerce and shipping and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it is hard. It's It's got huge, um, let me relocate to the living room. It's got huge natural resources. It's got gas, gold, um, it's got some oil, not like Kazakhstan, the neighboring country, but, you know, enough for self-sufficiency, but mainly gas. Mm -hmm. But like any other country in Central Asia, a problem with this resource is that we cannot transport them ourselves. Mm. All, the, all the networks, all the pipes at the moment go through Russia, like before. And to build a new pipeline, you need to go via Afghanistan, which is another problem. So that's why we pull dependent. Uh, um, it's, it's very hot in summer. It's extremely hot, and it's cold. The winter, it's uh, been governed for the last 20 years by the same guy uh, who's been there during the Soviet times. So we kind of have this person still in power, very, very authoritarian, um, basically it's a dictatorship. Uh, it is one thing about Uzbeks, it's... Somebody put it, and I like the way they write those facts, is that they're Japanese of Central Asia. Meaning they... are they hardworking? And maybe that would save the day for the country, because people really work hard. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, in any other country with the same problems of huge unemployment, um, uh, budgetary issues, and et cetera, et cetera, you would have a social revolution. And it's because some still have any and probably won't have any. It's because people are busy working. Mm. So that's in general. Yeah. Um, what else? Is, uh, it's, it's Uzbekistan... Got a, it's, sorry. Uzbekistan is mm -hmm. where... Um, uh, the capital is Tashkent, right? And that's where Samarkand is. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. 
Okay. It's a, the country of very ancient history, but we cannot claim it for ourselves because the history belongs to the whole region. Oh. Because back in those times, when we're talking about 15th, 14th century, there was no Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan was artificially created entity by pretty much at the beginning of the last century. Before that, was an entity called Turkestan, and before that, we just were like several kingdoms. So, as a country itself, it only started existing during the Russian occupation, meaning the Soviet occupation of Uzbekistan, and then later on, it became an independent country. So, when we're talking about Uzbek history, it's fundamentally wrong to say that it's only Uzbek history. The history which covers the whole Central Asia, and when this, uh, like we've been conquered by the Mongols, by the Alexander the Great, we've been conquered by many people. And pretty much everyone. We were on a way where the Silk Road was um, going through, so which created a very diverse culture, mm-hmm. heavily influenced by Chinese. Again, because of the historical reasons, even though we directly do not border China. The, the, because of the trade and everything else, and as, as well as, you know, we've been conquered by them at certain stage, certain part of Uzbekistan. It, it did influence this time. Um, it's, uh, so, therefore, when we're talking about these historical places like Samarkand and Bukhara, which these places have a huge meaning for the first place, this belongs to, you know, pretty much everyone. I would say that Uzbeks are the keepers of the places, but, you know. Okay. Neat. I'm kind of addicted to Google Earth, and I like just, you know, when I'm just stuck in my town and I can't travel, I like just playing around and seeing other places, and I don't know why, but there was a time when that part of the world, like, really captivated me, and, and I, you know, look on the streets and stuff, and Tashkent looks like a really pretty place. It is. I I have to say I haven't been to Tashkent for like almost eight years now, uh-huh. and I was told by everyone who is you know going there, especially my friends, that the city changed so much that it probably won't won't recognize it. It's been a big, pretty much nice city before, mm-hmm. but because it's the capital and because there's a lot of construction going on, the city expanded and everything else. It is beautiful. It's modern. Uh-huh. Tashkent was pretty much destroyed by the earthquake in 1967, oh. which is a really bad earthquake, which pretty much destroyed most of the town. So that's why what you have now is you have a modern city. It's not historical. It's more like, yes, this is the capital. The whole history of uh, when you want to see the historical, maybe you have to travel south, mm. where you, you have like Samarkand and Bukhara and other cities. Um, <laughs> I think we had a little glitch in our internet connection there. My connection is I can't really help it. Okay. Back to the kitchen, probably work out there or to the hallway. Yeah, something is weird going on. How about now? Yep, yeah, it's working just fine. Yeah, it go, like mostly it works just fine. Then all of a sudden it'll just lag a little bit and then it has to catch back up. Yeah, it's, it happens all the time. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. So, so, because of, like you were saying, just how diverse the history is and the people and stuff, what's the. What's the lifestyle like? You know, is um, is there like lots of different kinds of food, and you know, lots of like when you walk down the street, are there, the people look different from each other? And what's just the daily life like? I mean, the way Uzbeks look is very, is very, is very interesting. It's like in other countries, you go, you quite, you can't figure out the, you kind of figure out the pattern of the, of anthropological. Um, common features. Mm-hmm. But Uzbek is very hard because there's some Uzbeks who look like me, who are light skinned, you know, kind of more Asian looking. There are Uzbeks who are very Caucasian looking. There are Uzbeks who are dark hair or some blonde. Not the blonde, the redheads or whatever. And I think this is the, 
the the heritage of our culture, of our history, basically, because everyone who was passing through obviously left some genetical imprint. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, Tashkent itself is a very modern city, not in the way they're buildings, but pe- the way people look. People look like anyone else in Europe, for example. They wear the same kind of clothes. Oh. Uh, you have the same teenagers with the same crazy, from my point of view, fashion. Uh-huh. They're obsessed with everything Western, mainly because of MTV. Uh, absolutely, like on Facebook, some of them. Twitter is not really that big, but Facebook for sure. So you have typical normal people, like especially the teens. And then you have the, the probably the most of the population who are quite religious. So you see people who wear short skirts in the street and very good looking women. And then you have women who wear headscarves and cover themselves from head to toe. There's a huge, like, uh, it's, it's really it's really funny because we're on the same street, you can see people dressed up in a different way. Yeah. Uh, which does freak me out a bit because I'm like, I'm more a moderate person, somewhere in between. Uh-huh. But uh, because of the ongoing oppression and um, persecution of Muslims, as a result, a lot of people became become more religious. Mm-hmm. So this way of Islamic dressing is like very widespread. Oh. So you have that. But everyone is pretty much is hooked up on whatever is happening in the world. And even though like access to internet is, is in a way restricted, uh, although Facebook is not prohibited yet and Twitter as well, you have a problem accessing the websites of um, opposition oh. movements or uh, like independent news agencies. Mm-hmm. This is really hard, like the BBC, Radio Free Europe, CNN, you have really hard time logging on, like looking. So people use proxy servers to access them. But pretty much everything else is open. Mm-hmm. Uh, it always strikes me kind of weird because you easily can access any porn site from any internet cafe without any restrictions. And then when you want to log into the BBC, you have a huge problem. <laughs> oh, man. It just shows priorities, huh? If you, uh, if you want to rot your brain, that's fine. But if you want to speak your voice, then that's, that's against the law. Yeah, you know, because probably it's easier to control people with this kind of exactly. brain. Exactly. You know, I think a lot of governments are the same around the world, but... Our government's the same way here, you know. They would rather you just sit at home and watch porn all day than try to, like, you know, talk about what's happening in the world and connect with people, you know. Yeah, I know. It's very easy to control people for, manipulate people who are not educated. Yeah, they want pacified people for sure. Yeah, everyone does. I mean, it's easier that way. Like just uh, today, today, um... It, today's a big day because it's the first day of Bradley Manning's trial. And you, you know Bradley Manning? He was a, a soldier, a private in the yeah, army. On the radio. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, right. And he was the one that gave the video of the helicopter uh, killing civilians in Afghanistan. And they arrested him more than three years ago. And he's just been in a hole since then. And, you know, more than three years, he's finally getting his trial today. So, you know, a lot of people, same thing. It's like, here's a guy that didn't break any laws, you know. He just did what he was, he believed in. Even if that was against the law, you know, charge the guy and try him. Why did it take three years for him to get his day in court? Absolutely. No, I mean, America doesn't have democracy. No. It's extremely disappointing. It's like, it's very shocking every time there is a Democrats in power. I have a problem because they're always so cozy with authoritarian dictatorships. So it's always bad news for people like me. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, um, I'd like to ask you more about that because that's, you know, one thing that I want to do with this website is that as Americans, we think that we are like the freest country in the world and we are this champion of democracy and we're trying to give democracy to the rest of the world and everybody else is like kind of backwards. And I want to show people, you know, that, and it's not to, I'm not trying to degrade my country, but just to show people, look, this is what the truth really looks like. This is what's really going on. So, you know, let's preserve freedom in our own country, but then also look at just the way things really are. Just like you were saying about, um, like the youth in Uzbekistan. I was in Iran last year. I spent a couple weeks traveling around Iran and 
You're not allowed. You're American. No, it's it's not easy, but we we can go. You have to have like a. Uh, I <laughs> I didn't catch your sarcasm there. Yeah, for sure. Um, I told people that, and they were like, "Oh, you're going to Iran. You're gonna get your head cut off, and you know they're gonna lock you up in prison." And um, but just like you said, it was so crazy. Everywhere you go, there's just like just gangs of teenage girls and they're all texting, you know, and they dress, you know, they have to wear the headscarf and stuff, but they're not wearing like the full, you know, bed sheet and everything. And, and, uh, you know, we, we look at the world through the lens of terrorism and it's like, look, here's this country that's supposed to be so evil and they look like us and they have daily lives like us. And, you know, your country is the same way. And yeah, so that's just a big thing with my website. I'm trying to get out there. Yeah. I mean, come on. The best, export is like yeah lady gaga yeah everyone rihanna come on i mean she's like it's 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 a it, it's crazy but people are absolutely obsessed with this stuff american clothes yes please you know everything american is very exciting in terms of the material things mm -hmm. but when it comes to issues uh, bigger issues like um supporting democracy a genuine support for democracy and um, values, then you have a slight problem there. Mm -hmm. So, in a way, it's it's good to have the United States because still the idea of freedom is still there, even though it's expressed through art. I mean, let's put this whole thing as an art. Mm -hmm. uh, but when it comes to the government, then there's a problem. Yeah, like in sure. the case of Uzbekistan, whatever whatever happened during the Republicans, okay, Republicans were bad for the world probably because they started the war in Afghanistan. As far as Uzbekistan was concerned, every time anyone from the United States was flying in, we had at least one or two human rights defender released from the prison because they knew how to talk to the government. This time you have NATO troops withdraw and American troops withdraw from Afghanistan in 2014. And not only the United States, but also the like European Union, they're happy to do whatever the Uzbek government tells them to do and close, shut their eyes on everything, everything problematic just to get the staff out. They're leaving all, almost all the military equipment there as much as they could in Uzbekistan. And when you ask people questions and why, and do you realize that this military stuff, all this hardware, is going to be used against the people of Uzbekistan? Like it was in 2005, when the peaceful protesters were shot with, in, a, in a very butchered kind of way. So you're leaving all this crap there, excuse my language, and, and nobody gives you any answers. Because this is the way it should be. And you kind of think, okay, well, you can't help it because... This is the done deal. Mm -hmm. um, so you just kind of feel disappointed. But not anymore, really. That's just so crazy. It's just another example of we like to... We portray a certain image, but we don't actually... There's no substance behind it. You know, we like to say, oh, well... I, I don't know. I mean, the other I used an example the other day talking to a guy about how... You know, we have these allies on the in the war on terror. And... In, in some cases, they're like these dictators that, like you said, you know, they crack down on their own people, but they, they say that that's terrorism. They're fighting extremists. Therefore, we get to, you know, add another tally mark to our alliance and go, oh, it's not just us. You know, it's a, it's a global thing, but the reality on the ground is different. So it sounds like, you know, what you're saying is just another example of that. You know, we like to be able to portray a certain story, but the situation on the ground is totally different. And Yeah, it really undermines the reputation of America, mm -hmm. it's it, it really does because people don't believe anymore. And then when it comes to the core values, exactly like fighting with Islamic extremism, what do you understand by that? Do you fight Islamic extremism with force? No. Look, I'm Muslim. I know what it is. You do not fight the ideology with with weapons. You don't. You work with people's minds, mm -hmm. and for that. It's very easy to go and shoot people and arrest, but this is very short term and doesn't work. What you do, you promote education. Mm -hmm. In proper education, will solve this problem probably halfway without losing 
people's life and without making other people angry. But nobody wants to do that, you know. It's easy to satisfy the demands of the military, I mean, war, military hardware producers. Well, you, you can't make awesome action movies out of building schools and funding, you know, development programs. That There's no glory in that. In your elections. What's that? That really doesn't win you elections. No, no. It's, problem, go shoot people. And then, yeah, everyone was like, yeah, you're my hero. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's a human nature thing, but it's definitely an America thing, too. You know, we want to ride out there and meet our enemies head on and smash them, you know, and plant our flag on the ground. And, you know, mm -hmm. but that, that's a, you know, it's the glorious solution and it's fast, but it doesn't work. You know, nobody wants to say, hey, let's invest time and energy and and care over the next 20 or 30 years to make people's lives better i always say that same thing you know nobody chooses extremism you know no if 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 you give somebody the option between education and opportunity and and health and a better future or you know a suicide vest what are they going to choose you know we like to think that there's people out there that are just so inherently evil that we got to go kill them but it's not, that's not the case at all. No. Yeah, of nobody, course. Nobody wants hate. Everybody around the world just wants the same thing, you know? It's like with Afghanistan. And now the troops are going to be leaving next year. And what exactly are they leaving behind? How many roads were built? How many schools were built? How many school hospitals were built? Where is the infrastructure? And you know, it does affect us Uzbeks because we border Afghanistan. And the only way to get anything properly to Afghanistan is through Uzbekistan. And it's an extremely volatile situation. Plus the drugs. You know, we're the main point for transit of Afghan heroin. How cool is that? Does anyone do anything about it? No. Because I don't understand why. For example, Uzbekistan is a, is a very corrupt country. So when we're talking about the huge quantities of transit of heroin from Afghanistan, we're talking about corruption from from the simple border guard to the to the very top in mean, the president. Mm -hmm. That trade is controlled by the National Security Service and police and everything else. And the, the, then the stuff goes could be could go go goes through Russia or goes some other way, like through Iran, through Turkmenistan to the West ultimately. Uh, and here, where I live, the United Kingdom is the biggest recipient of Afghan heroin. And nobody seems to bother, to, at least to do something to stop this stuff. Yeah, nobody That's in America talks about that. You know, in the last, you know, what, 12 years since we've been in Afghanistan, the amount of heroin being produced and exported has gone up like, I can't even remember, you know, how many hundreds or thousands of percent, you know, and the, the quality has gone up and the price has gone down and, and just the, like that industry has just exploded. Mm -hmm. That's not a, it's not a legacy that we talk a, a very often about. about no. involvement there. Well, what's even worse, Karen, that during this whole campaign of Western troops being in Afghanistan, Afghanistan became the producer of heroin. It, they've never been producers. They've been the, you know, the first shipping country from Pakistan. Heroin was produced in Pakistan. But the Afghan farmers became the producers. Mm. So these people who cannot read or write have this, know this chemical formula to produce heroin from opium. How cool is that? That's crazy. That's the biggest achievement. So, you know, being being that you're so close and you have a perspective on that, what's, I don't know, and obviously you've kind of touched on it already, but um, what's kind of the, the end result of the war in Afghanistan? Like, it, it, should we just have never gone there in the first place, or did we do some good things, but it's been offset by bad things, or what's your your take on the war? My take on the war is from the beginning is very negative, mm -hmm. and it's more negative now. You know, because, again, A, we border Afghanistan, B, there was a Soviet invasion in Afghanistan, which uh, finished in 89 when the Soviet troops were withdrawn finally. Mm -hmm. This campaign, this 10-year campaign, ended up an absolute disaster. And uh, it was a huge scar, and 
we kind of learn our lesson. We, meaning me, even my generation, I remember those soldiers, the little kids who went there, came back absolutely traumatized. So that was the butchered war. The only thing which Soviet did, they built, they, they built infrastructure in Afghanistan, which still exists, which actually the same airports where the Western troops were using for landing and stuff like that. Yeah, Bagram was an old Russian base, huh? And it still is. Nothing new significantly was built during this occupation, I mean this war in Afghanistan. The rule number one, which the British kind of learned, the Russian learned, probably the Americans will never learn, you do not go to Afghanistan to fight because you will always lose. Nobody won any war in Afghanistan. They are extremely, um, they, they are very good fighters and um, in a way that it's, it's a cursed land. Foreigners now in a different way. You don't fight with the guns, but you fight with you get land. Especially, look, we're talking about the country which most of the mentality of most men probably in the level of probably level 17th, 16th century, and you're sending them some American soldier or a, a commander who to them is like somebody from Mars. <laughs> <laughs> Just honestly. I saw these people and like I was standing on a border between Tajikistan and Afghanistan and there is a bridge and the people were coming for trade and I looked at them and I thought that this is the past, like time travel. These people were what I would imagine Uzbekistan was and probably, okay, thought. 16th, 17th century. Mm-hmm. Everything is so weird about them. The way they look, the way they behave, the, the, is everything. Uh, and imagine them with their mentality seeing this big, tall guy with very strange manners. They, they are like people from Mars. Mm-hmm. Do that. You just don't approach Afghan issue like that. So unfortunately, the whole country is a mess. And the, the, the regime which installed the Karzai government is corrupt. He himself is allegedly corrupt. I mean, his brother was one of the people who was controlling drug trade. So what do you leave? You leave mess? You leave uh, even back bigger mess and incredible. And the new producer, welcome the new producer of heroin to the world. Thank you very much. My problem is that we have to eat. We have to deal with that. We are the neighbors. And it immediately backfires on us. Big time. Because the amount of drug users in Central Asia increased dramatically over the last 10 years, unfortunately. Oh, man. That's one thing we don't talk about much either, you know, is that the the ripples you know you drop a big rock in the pond and you know afghanistan is that big rock and then it affects everything else you know, it so, does you know we don't to sort out this problem nothing else couldn't be sorted out but uh, how you approach this problem i have no idea yeah but, well, most was... americans have kind of you know we're tired of war you know but most americans are just they want it to be done and we say you know okay well we kind of admit that that was kind of a failed adventure, you know, we got a time to end it, but it's not just there, you know, it's like, well, there's lasting repercussions, you know, all over the region and the rest of the world. That's right. Yeah. So tell me about your, your work because, um, you're a, you're a journalist, right? And you, you know, report on issues in Uzbekistan. So does tell me about, you know, what, what your message is. Um, I am an independent journalist, and I am a critic of the current regime. But my job as a journalist is to c- uncover anything which is wrong, and there is a lot of things wrong in Uzbekistan. And we're talking about the uh, hundreds, probably thousands, of religious prisoners being rotten in Uzbek prison without any access to a proper justice system. We're talking about huge unemployment and incredible amount of migrant labor, or mi- migrant laborers in Russia without any rights whatsoever. And we're talking about at least three million people, at least. 
um, we're talking about a despotism, total lack of rule of law from the very little level of the government up to the bottom. And this is one of the most corrupt countries in the world. So you have the whole package here to talk about. The problem with Uzbekistan is that not only the free press is not allowed, there is no single opposition party in Uzbekistan. Everyone is outside. The, one, the, people, the opposition people who are not outside are or in prison or dying in prison. It's very simple, as simple as that. Um, uh, it's very difficult for foreign journalists to come to Uzbekistan because of the visa restrictions and then if they come there, um, they have a mentor, you know, who comes and goes, so you can't really operate, you seriously cannot operate in the country. I call it a functioning dictatorship, a dictatorship which, with a very sophisticated um, uh, machine for repression and control over the people through instigating fear, uh, persecuting people, and um, blackmail. So, and if anyone could talk about evil countries, so I would say this is a, an evil regime. Uh, again, my access to sources is very limited because I live far away, I'm not allowed to go back. I mean, I'm technically allowed to go back, but I don't want to go because I'll be in jail. Yeah, you, you wouldn't want to try. No. So I try to do as much as I can. My main work, I'm an investigative journalist, so I do stuff for um, British um, newspapers and, and networks here about the UK domestic stuff. This is a separate thing, but, you know, whenever I can, I, I do write about Uzbekistan. Mm -hmm. And here I always find myself in a difficult position because I cannot be, it's difficult to me to be unbiased. So I kind of feel always, I always have to double check because for me as a journalist, being unbiased and objective is absolutely important. And no matter how strongly I feel about the government, I really have to give them a chance sometimes too. But I, I have to double check my work whenever, whatever, whatever I write. Uh, I have to mention also that this is a country which had a um, 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 A forced female sterilization as it is a part of control of population growth and we only found out about it like two years ago through the reports of doctors how did how did that happen how was that carried out uh, well for example you're a woman you had the second or third child and somebody decides that okay after three children you cannot have you don't you don't need any more children so without consent women were sterilized in the, uh, in the hospitals where they were delivering babies. Uh, and some of them didn't even have any idea that it happened. Uh, and there was pretty a, soon, the, you know, they just started realizing, wow, we have all these women who are coming into the hospital with, you know, problems they can't get pregnant, and they find out, oh, you, I've been sterilized. Who came, who didn't understand why she can't conceive. And her husband wanted to divorce her. And then she went to the, you know, to check up for the, uh, or to the gynecologist and he said, well, you can't have any children. <laughs> you know, as simple as that. Uh, wow. Uh, yeah, but access to this information is extremely difficult because we, we're not allowed in. But I helped a couple of journalists to go and set up the interviews with them, with one of the very good doctors in the province who, who brought these women who did testify that they had been sterilized and have huge problems about it. It was, it was quite shocking. Um, and I'm sure they're doing it now. This is the way they control the population growth. Without giving people choice, they just do it forcefully. This is the attitude. The other problem with Uzbekistan, which I didn't mention, I have to mention, so this is the country which uses uh, forced child labor to pick cotton because we are one of the main uh, cotton producers in the world and cotton is the only thing 
the main thing which gives the government hard currency. Uh, and over the years, uh, during the cotton picking up season, meaning September, December, schools were closed. All kids were picking cotton, mainly for free. Whoa. Pick the peanuts. Kids live in horrible conditions. I mean, without you cannot believe it that there's no access to toilets, to water, to anything. Uh, and uh, they just pick cotton every day. And if they if their parents don't want to send them, then uh, the parents are threatened that they're not going to have um, social benefits. They're going to have social benefits cut, or the kids kids is going to be expelled from school. Or oh, mother's father is going to be expelled from work. Wow. So, and then there, is a, there was a big campaign which started like four years ago to eradicate forced child labor, which kind of brought some results because more than 100 companies, world companies, who are like producing cotton, they do not buy Uzbek cotton. But now the government decided to resolve the situation in a different way. Last year, uh, little kids were not sent to pick cotton but kids from the age of 15 to 17. Starting from the age of 15, kids were in cotton fields. And then, of course, students uh, from the universities, and now the state employees as well, like doctors, teachers, everyone has to go and pick cotton. And nobody pays them anything, of course. But they have to. Wow. I just wrote a story about the doctors in cotton fields. I mean, even now, They've been sent to plow the cotton fields, like doctors, surgeons who operate. <laughs> that is crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. The whole polyclinics, what do you have it in um, America? What do you call this? Centers, when you're sick, you go. Like, they're not hospitals. Yeah, clinic but or something. Clinics, whole clinics were closed last year. Because, you say, okay, it was, I had a very funny picture with handwritten note. Uh, clinic is closed. All on, all picking cotton. Wow, that makes me think of like, you know, the old Soviet command style economies where they go, okay, you know, this we you know we're gonna make this many refrigerators. It doesn't matter, you know, no no free market stuff. It's the same thing. The government's like, all right, this is our job. You know, we're gonna do. We gotta pick the cotton, and you know, this is your duty to the motherland. You go contribute in the fields. Wow, yeah. that's so crazy! Like you said, you know, nobody's getting paid. You, and you better not get sick during that time. You don't, you don't go to school and learn anything. Wow. Yeah, but this is a Soviet command economy. We have a guy who was a Soviet communist leader. He's got this mentality, uh -huh. so he carries uh -huh. on the same practice. And kind of the worst part is you were saying before how. The Uzbek people kind of have a mentality of you just kind of keep your head down and do your work so nobody really speaks up about it, huh? Or I'm, I'm sure there's got to be some kind of groundswell of um, opposition to, to stuff like this. Uh, okay, inside Uzbekistan, there's no opposition. The only possible opposition which can emerge in, in a way, uh, put people together is Islamic opposition. It doesn't exist. Because the government successfully cracked down every single movement. Mm -hmm. Like, um, it, it was done systematically, continuously, uh, for the last 15 years. Uh, so, I would say that probably, from my very rough estimates, because nobody knows the exact number of prisoners in Uzbekistan, this is a classified data. Uh, I think probably 50% of those are people jailed for religious, for being just religious people, without committing any crime. Uh, now, we, the, in 2005, in May, in one of the cities in Uzbekistan, this kind of revolt started when people just went to the main square and started protesting. It ended up with more than a thousand people dead, a lot of refugees, and continue, and then a huge crackdown in, in the city. 
people were shot down by snipers, by um, um, the dead. Wait a second, what is this vehicle called? Armored vehicles mm-hmm. without any warning. And it was just absolute butchery. So that thing really did the fact. So now people, you know, like you look at what's happening in Turkey and you go, oh, wow, that's so cool to see, you know, the, the, the people taking to the streets and speaking their voice. But people, people in Uzbekistan are like, we better not try that. Otherwise, they're just going to come out and kill us again. Yes. And what is worse, that the official propaganda works so well that even people like me who try to speak out of Galima, we are viewed very negatively by a lot of people think, oh, those people are paid by foreigners, mm-hmm. exactly like the Soviet times. You've been indoctrinated by the West, and they, yeah, they yeah. brainwash you, you to hate your own people. Yeah, you black, you, you paid to black mouth your, your, your country. Mm-hmm. So you, you view it as a traitor. Crazy. Um, but yeah, this is like... If anything's right. going to change, it's going to have to be people like you, huh? I mean, if you can't speak up from the inside, it's going to have to be people from the outside that are that try to. I don't know what what's the solution. What? How does Uzbekistan move forward? Uh, well, naturally, the president is getting very old. He's seventy eight, I think. And there is no, there is a huge issue now with succession. Who is going to be the next? And nobody even talking about some free and fair elections. Forget about it. Uh, it is going to be something when he decides, okay, this guy or my daughter, I mean his daughter, mm-hmm. is going to be taking over. I think what realistically could happen is that he dies and then there's a big fight between people who want to succeed him. I mean, the fight started already. There is a lot of nasty stuff going on uh, with businesses on the upper level. So you could see when somebody's getting sacked, how power changes. So it's a mess now. It's going to be even worse mess later. My problem is that people like me, we cannot do anything from outside. Our hands are tight. We can talk about it. Uh, but um, we cannot do anything inside. To organize any kind of Forget about revolution. I really don't like revolution. To p- a popular movement inside uh, requires you being you access to the country. Mm-hmm. And we can't. Even like from the neighboring country, it will be very difficult to do. So uh, the, the, the main worry for people like me is that because there's a huge Islamic element in the country, people are very religious. I mean, most of the country is quite religious. And in a way, Islamic sentiment does um, unite people and make them very fearless. And because there was a 20 years of systematic abuse, people believe that the solution could be the Islamic government. And this is what I don't want. Mm-hmm. Because it's one thing you're fighting dictatorship and another thing you're fighting Islamic forces because then the, then there's a huge problem for the whole region yeah and, uh, for sure uh, oh man so I cannot give anyone good news I mean any kind of optimism mm-hmm. but I don't see it yeah I'm always involved in some kind of you know um, scheming or thinking of some scenarios of how to do this, how to do that. At this stage, I can't see any possibility. Mm-hmm. Everything is going to be done from inside, and probably what the best I can hope for is that okay, President said okay, that guy is going to be taking over, and maybe it's going to be better for everyone. Mm-hmm. What um. I don't know, what does the average person feel about these things? Like, you know, the, the, the average person, um, does this stuff weigh really heavy on their, their mind? And do people feel oppressed and downtrodden? Or, you know, what, what impact does it have on this person every day? Well, it doesn't have any impact. Because, you know, in Uzbekistan, it's like a bad marriage. 
uh, like when husband and wife live their separate lives under the same roof. Uh-huh. The government and people who are in the government, the elite, lives their own life absolutely unrelated to the life of the ordinary people. I, I think the only way they kind of uh, interact is when the government collects taxes. That's all. Uh, people are so busy. The, the, the conditions are such that it's so difficult to earn money. Uh-huh. So everyone is busy of like either leaving the country to Russia and Kazakhstan to find work and just sit down and get money and do your everyday business. We all live abroad. But people do not care who is going to be next or what's going to happen. People wonder. But you know, they, because they're so used to sort out their problems themselves, mm-hmm. that's what they're dealing with. So whoever comes, again, I'm telling you, it's like two parallel realities. Sometimes yeah. you wonder. <laughs> well, that's really interesting to me because obviously I'm an extremely political person. And, you know, I this website so much fun. I get to talk to people like you from all over the world. And there's these issues about America, about my country that make me so mad. I'm like, you know, look, this is the the legacy that we're leaving for the world. This is the way people look at us. This is how our country is... A, impact in the lives of other people and a lot of people i talk to they're kind of like well that that sucks but you know it's so far removed from our reality like we don't really most people don't really care you know it's it's almost like it's not even the same world it's like that's just you know that that's the section that takes up 10 minutes on the news but then the rest of your day is just you know what i mean it's totally separate so people yeah but it's you at home at the moment, there are two Uzbek guys being detained in America in connection to extremism, trying to kill someone. Mm-hmm. I mean, this does backfire at home. Yeah. That's the problem. Exactly. With Americans, that's... they feel they live in a different planet. Mm-hmm. I mean, my husband is American, so I, I know. But it's so close. Look at those brothers, Tsanaevs from Chechnya. Mm-hmm. And... So it's it's there. Yeah, exactly. I 100% agree. And that's what I try to tell people. Like like I said, you know, people feel like it's a different world, but it's not. You know, that now more than ever, we're so interconnected. And, and you know, there's consequences for our actions, positive and negative. You know, and, and so whether or not you choose to pay attention to it, it, it will affect and is affecting our country. So we need to you know, make sure that we're doing things that we can be proud of and live with our conscience, you know. But the question I wanted to ask is, kind of like in Uzbekistan, you know, a lot of people, like you were saying, it's just two different planes, it's a different reality. Um, and so, like, on, on this website, I want to do something very positive. And I, I want to do something to bring people together, you know, and... and um, I feel like, especially in America, you know, the government kind of dictates our relationships with people. You know, they say these are the good guys, these are the bad guys, these are terrorists, these people love freedom or whatever. And I, I want to see something where individual people can connect with each other and say, look, we're not going to go fight any more of these wars because we realize that they're just like us, you know. But recently I find myself having a lot of conversations like this, you know, about <laughs> kind of the, the real negative impact that America has. So I, I don't want to be negative about my country i don't want to um people think that i'm talking down or that i'm fatalistic or anything so how like how do you is with with your experience in your country how do you balance those two like you love your country and you want to you know promote peace and freedom and positivity but i don't know does that make sense it does make sense but in general you know i think it's kind of or 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 i'll i can now acknowledge truth People like dealing with Americans for one important reasons because a they're quite straightforward and they're very simple and kind of receptive compared to Europeans. And for example, like even when I speak to American person, I know I don't need to decipher anything, and it's kind of what is said is said. Mm-hmm. Sometimes no, but most of the times. And they're very kind-hearted, you know, ordinary, ordinary Americans. Like, I'm part of this group called Central Eurasian Leadership Academy, which is funded by 
one American business association for the last 10 years. And this guy's done an incredible job of getting people from all Central Asia and the Caucasus countries plus Afghanistan together. I mean, the like people from the government, NGOs, journalists. So we meet every year and they're funding this thing to build up the network. And it took them a lot of effort because I know how hard we to organize us, people from the former Soviet Union. But they never gave up and they really show incredible example of commitment and uh, the way things should be done. So on a personal level, in general, American are loved. When it comes to the government, then it, there's a problem. And the problem is that kind of people in general understand, yeah, that's why they're doing it, because they have to get the troops out. And they don't have a choice but to use this route and to submit to the dictator. But then there's some other mechanisms to get what you want from the same dictator. Mm -hmm. And this is not used, but this is a totally different thing. So I think it's very important to differentiate be between the American people and the policy of the US administration. Uh, one, you have on a, one level you have just a person, on the other level you have geopolitical interests, um, which is a bit, you know, different thing. but. Honestly, what they're doing is they're doing a great job in general. In like even in the in the neighboring countries as well. It's it's kinda cool. It's just that particular issue is a problem. That's encouraging for me to hear. I I uh am so critical of, of what we do so much, so it makes me feel good knowing that we're doing good things too. No, 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 absolutely. You know, even in a country like Uzbekistan, which is a very hard country to operate, things are still done by, uh, for example, USAID. Uh, they're trying to run, I mean, they're trying to be, get cozy with the government just to be able to do something with the civil society. And I have a lot of arguments with them about this, you know. But at the same time, it does help at least some people, you know, at least to build up something. Maybe if, if they carry on a couple of seminars for the Uzbek official, maybe here, somewhere here, things are going to change. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there's a incredible support from a National Endowment for Democracy uh, and NED and NDI. Uh, these foundations who do work with human rights activists and support them for a number of years. So this different projects, you know, uh, trying to promote freedom of expression or even to fund the activities to go and um, to the courts and get all this information about people who are persecuted and stuff like that. So it's, it's incredibly important, especially in countries like Uzbekistan where we have like seriously probably five or six human rights defenders for the whole country. Wow. Those who are speaking. Mm -hmm. That's it's it's really terrible. When you talk about the outsiders, people who speak critically of the regime, they're exactly fine. That's how bad it is. Because everyone is so free. So because of these people and, and in a way like NDI and India, they're also part like not government, but they're the institutions by the Democratic Party. And yes, they do stuff. And, you know, things are going on. That's the, probably the best thing about American policy because they can diversify. On one hand, you have the administration, you have Pentagon, you have State Department, who also do different things. Sometimes not particularly they agree. In, in case of Uzbekistan, I would say. But at the same time, you have on the other level, you have these institutions who are not really uh, government, they kind of related to the government, who are funding the civil society. So this is the best thing. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I so, no, I mean, Americans are doing a great job. It's, uh, it's just, you know, Afghanistan, they screwed up a little bit. But... <laughs> But nobody, nobody, nobody was successful. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's too bad that we can't, 
uh, hear more about the things that are working, you know, and as a way of just um, raising awareness about, the, about other options, you know, because here, yeah, we're wrapping up in Afghanistan and um, in Iraq, but we're talking about going into Iran now, you know, so to, I don't know, it seems like maybe we could do more to promote the visibility of, you know, like you were saying, here's these other things that are doing really good. Maybe we can learn those lessons. And, and so people know that there's all these other non-military options that are successful that we should try. I don't know. That's another issue that's so much above my head. Because in terms of Iran, there is a big geopolitics, but I would say this is probably going to be the biggest mistake because it incredible. I mean, Whatever happened, like with Iraq and Syria, is absolutely dreadful. Uh, when it comes to the country like Iran, w- to which we have a very strong historical, cultural, whatever connection, mm-hmm. I mean, they're very close. That it it inspires the sentiment of brotherhood, mm-hmm. even though they're Shiites. So it. It, it makes even people like me extremely angry. You do not go and do that. Yeah. Listen to the Iranian people to sort it out naturally. You know, do not go to Iran because then you have Azerbaijan, you have Turkey, you have this whole mess. And you know who, who are the first people who benefit from the mess? The drug regime. Dealers. No, the drug dealers. Ah. Because whenever you have a war, then you have a free go at any passage of any drugs possible. Mm-hmm. That's one thing that I saw when I was in Iran that, you know, they, they're a continuous culture that goes back 2,500 years. And they have so many reasons to be proud of their culture, you know, and, and um, to, to be respected. And a lot of people look at there in Iran, America's policy towards them is being very condescending, you know, that we're the this powerful force and you guys are down here. And they're like, you know, you, you guys have been around for a few hundred years. We go back 2,500 years and there's so, so much, you know, amazing history and culture from here. And it's just, it's seen to be just very disrespectful. And like you said, you know, like you, that, invoking the feeling of brotherhood too. Oh, no, I mean, come on. This is one of the nation, uh, ancient nations. And uh, it's amazing. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, we almost qu- talked for an hour, so I don't want to take up, you know, your, your whole evening. I'll let you get to bed. But I just want to ask a couple questions. And just the first is, is there anything that we haven't covered yet that people need to know about Uzbekistan? No, pretty much touch on everything. All right. Yeah. So just one last question then. Just um, if you you know, had an opportunity to give one message to everybody in the world, if you were on your soapbox and you could say anything, whether it's a personal level or Uzbekistan or whatever, what message would you want to impart to the world? Uh, the message would be everyone should try the absolute best to invest whatever money in education. And that will solve a lot of problems, especially in education in Muslim countries. Mm -hmm. That will solve a lot of women's issues. It will solve other issues and will incredibly decrease the amount of extremism. Yeah. Um, Are you familiar with, like, uh, the Khan Academy... And I'm trying to think of other names, but like online education sources, because these websites are popping up where they have all of these courses and subjects that you can study, sometimes for free, sometimes paid, but all online. Are there access to things like that in places like Uzbekistan? Well, first of all, internet connection is not that good. Mm. Second, most of the stuff is in English. We're talking about basic schools. In a countries like that, like countries like Pakistan, Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, you have to start with a very little level. There are no schools. Mm-hmm. Just like literacy so, and stuff like I mean, that. 
it, it's going down. Unfortunately, it does going on. Computers, you know what? Forget about it. Like if you go to the the big cities, yeah, the internet cafes, this and that. But in small cities, come on, we have the computers. Uh, so they there still might not be some right know, flashy the, high tech solution. It's just literally just building schools and bringing in yeah. books. We're talking about very basic stuff. Just remember this. Afghan of 16th century and American from Mars. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. You have to put yourself down and start from the scratch. And be because, you know, especially with the male population, with, which is radicalized faster than a female population, they need a lot of education. They need a lot of access to different sources of information because if they get hooked up to this one particular crazy element, then they're totally brainwashed. And then, yeah, something should be done with their brain. Oh, I, trust me, I spoke to people like that, and it feels like they just need some time, brain surgery. <laughs> yeah. I, no, I mean, yes, yeah, situation when you can't help. I totally understand. It's like when you talk to Americans about... You know, like militarism and like drones. You know, you say, oh, I, yeah. just, I, I don't think that we should be blowing up people with robots. And they go, no, no, we have to. We have to. Uh, you know, we have to do it to keep ourselves safe. And it's legal and it's just and it's moral. And you go, what? And then when that's your, your president that's saying those things, you're like, that's just so crazy. That's not fair to kill anyone like that. Yeah. That's not manly. First of all, it's not human. So when another government, like Uzbek government, goes and tries to kill someone in a foreign country, assassination, oh my God, it's so terrible. But killing people with robots, it's okay. Yeah. How about, where's the logic? I think the same way. <laughs> he needs a brain operation if he thinks that that's the right thing to yes, do. Sir. Psychotherapy won't work. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Gary. Thank you Listen. so much for talking to me. I really appreciate it. All right, good luck with your projects, Tuesday. It's a very good thing you're doing. Cool, thank you. Let me know if you need anything else. All right, and vice versa. Okay, thanks. All right, have a good night. So there you have it. I hope that you enjoyed that conversation. I hope you learned a lot about Uzbekistan. Uh, there's a lot of things that I didn't know about that place, both good and bad. And, and especially, I really enjoyed hearing about uh, the impact that America has over there. Uh, we hear a lot of bad things, and especially me being kind of a political person, I, you know, uh, focus on a lot of the, the shortcomings that we have. But like Shahiba was saying, there's a lot of things that America is doing that are really good in that part of the world. So that was really encouraging to hear. And I just really enjoy getting to learn from her as somebody who is passionate about her country and speaking up and raising her voice for change. So I hope you enjoyed it too. I hope you learned some stuff. And stay tuned next time for more interviews. Thanks.